Hello everyone, and welcome back to DMG. This big pile of old laptops behind me all have something in common. Well, they have a few things in common. They're all Dells, mostly Latitudes from the mid-2000s. But the important thing they have in common is that they all use an Intel platform. Uh, either Centrino or Core 2 Duo, which is really the same thing, they all are Intel-based with Intel chipsets, Intel CPUs, and a lot of the Intel graphics. The Core 2 Duo was just so good that, for a while, Dell didn't offer any laptops with AMD CPUs. So, I bought one of the last Dell Latitudes with an AMD mobile CPU. This is the Latitude D531 with an AMD Torion 64X2 at 2 gigahertz. And here it is. It looks just like a regular Latitude D530 and the just calling it the D531 really makes the AMD upgrade or well upgrade seem like an afterthought and that's kind of what it is because this is just a normal latitude and you could never tell from the outside that this is an AMD machine uh, of course until you look at the sticker so let's take a closer look this latitude is actually a little bit older than some others I own so first let's just go around the side this one is 2006-ish, 2006-2007, versus the other latitudes in my collection, which are mostly 2008 through 2009. So it's more the age of the XPS M1710 that I covered recently. But just going around the side, on this side we have what just looks like an optical drive, but I'll come back to that later, two USB 2.0 ports, on the back, we have RJ45 S Video, two USB 2 ports, modem 56K, VGA serial charger port, the fan exhaust. This is actually not fan exhaust, this is fan intake. Then here's IE 1394 Firewire, headphone, microphone. That's not a smart card reader. I just have the wrong bezel because it didn't come with one. A PCMCIA slot, your hard drive, and there's absolutely nothing on the front. Now, that bay that doesn't look special at all is a hot swap optical drive, but unlike the later latitudes, it uses this weird connector with a bunch of pins that actually looks a lot like SCSI. Now this is actually just a plastic caddy that the CD-ROM drive goes in. This is just a SATA drive underneath, I believe, and you could take all of this off and just have a regular optical drive. There's actually a PCB back here that I can feel through the plastic, so I bet this is just a regular optical drive, and if you took all of this mess off, you could swap it out. So luckily, it's not completely proprietary. But this connector also allows you to plug in secondary batteries into this bay, which is a pretty neat thing. Now that's not just exclusive to the AMD version, that would be on the regular Latitude D530 as well, but I thought I should mention it since it's pretty neat. Now let's get to the screen and touchpad and keyboard area, because let's face it, that's what you're going to be looking at most when you use a laptop. The case is entirely plastic although it is very sturdy feeling plastic. Yes, although the back does look like metal, in fact, the only metal part of it is the Dell badge. And that also applies to the keyboard and touchpad area. This is all just nice, smooth plastic. It's not too sticky. It doesn't have that weird rubber coating that a lot of old laptops do. Uh, do. It's quite good feeling plastic. It's not cheap and flimsy. Here we can see the OS this shipped with is actually Windows XP instead of Vista or even Windows 7 that a lot of my other old laptops shipped with. And of course, here is our AMD Chorion 64 X2 sticker. 
I believe these Torion 64X2 CPUs are based off the architecture of the desktop Athlon 64X2, which is the AMD K8 architecture. There were Athlon 64 mobile CPUs, but I believe... Hey, I said something wrong here. Turns out Turion 64 Mobile is the lower power variant of the Athlon 64 Mobile, but they are on the same architecture. The only difference is power consumption. On the upper left hand side of the keyboard, we have the Latitude D531 logo and indicator lights for several lock keys on the keyboard. We have a pretty large button, a discrete button to turn off wireless, and the power button right in the middle of the keyboard. Up to the left we have indicator lights for power, hard drive, battery, and Wi-Fi. And there's a pretty huge ambient light sensor to the right of the left hinge. The keyboard is the same style as the XPS M1710 in, in that it has this extra bank of keys to the top right. Later latitudes eliminated these four keys and just had three up here, but they were in a slightly different layout. You don't get a point stick and the associated set of buttons for it, which I like having that. I mainly use the secondary buttons instead of the actual point stick itself because sometimes it's more convenient to hit buttons up here rather than closer to the bottom of the trackpad. But onto the trackpad, for the era it is decently sized, it's more than usable, and Dell actually doesn't have downloads for this trackpad for above Windows Vista. Getting trackpad drivers for this laptop is a bit difficult. They don't offer any 64-bit OS downloads, and I don't think they even offer anything above Windows XP for the trackpad on the download page for this laptop anyway. However, you can download the Windows Vista or Windows 7 uh, X64 drivers from Dell's download page for the Latitude E6400. And if you install them on this laptop, if you're running a 64-bit OS, they run great. So that is what I'm using here. We'll get back to the keyboard and the speakers later. But continuing our physical overview, let's look up a little bit at our display. It's a 15-inch display at a resolution of 1280 by 800. I've said this in the past, but I will say it again. 1280 by 800 looks great on small notebooks like the 12-inch Latitude E4200, but when you scale that resolution up to a 15-inch laptop, it can start looking a bit grainy. So although the screen resolution isn't the highest, it is still above HD, so it still looks okay. It's not the worst I've seen. The screen is also decently bright and has quite good viewing angles. Up here we have just two latches for locking the lid and the associated switch to actuate them, and that's all we have on the top side. Flipping it over reveals a much more blocky and modular base than the later latitudes, namely the E6400. Up here, we have the battery in this odd-shaped pack. Under here is one RAM slot, the other is under the keyboard. And here is your hard drive that will slide out. I do like how in later Dell Latitudes, most of the upgradability can be done from the bottom. In here, of course, there's only one RAM slot accessible from the bottom, so why even have a door? because to upgrade the RAM to the full potential, you'll still need to take off the keyboard. You also need to remove the keyboard to do wireless card upgrades, CPU swaps, and really anything else that you could do in a laptop. Something I did neglect to mention is you don't have any volume buttons that are discrete. On later latitudes, you have a set of three volume buttons, volume down, volume up, and mute but here those keys are on page up, page down, and end. So you hold down the function key to adjust your volume. Continuing on with the keyboard, I'll do a quick typing test. I'm really bad on this keyboard. I don't like the feel of it. 
there isn't much travel and it feels pretty mushy. I'm glad that they improved this in the later latitudes like the E6400 because this keyboard, although far from unusable, it's definitely not what I was expecting. And the same can also be said for the speakers. Although I never expect exceptional speakers on a business laptop such as this, they aren't even as good as some later latitudes. If you like mid-range, these speakers are just for you because they fail to accurately reproduce highs or lows, so you really just do get everything in the middle. Luckily though, that is where human voice range is, so if you're, say, doing a Zoom meeting on a 15-year-old laptop for whatever reason, you'll still be able to hear clearly what the other person is saying. Now let's talk more about actual hardware. One of the most important things for a laptop to achieve is a solid balance between efficiency and performance, meaning battery life and how fast it is. Especially in a business laptop where you want a really good mix between the two. So is this laptop really fast or is it really efficient or does it manage to find a middle ground? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't do any of the three. The Turion 64X2 did confirm my prejudices against AMD at this time in that they're about 400 megahertz per core slower than an Intel CPU because a 1.6 gigahertz Core 2 Duo SU9600 manages to be about 10% faster in single core and 2% faster in multi-core than this Turion chip. Now, of course, gigahertz isn't all that matters. Wattage also does, which directly is linked to battery life. That Core 2 Duo chip uses 10 watts. And the Turion 64 is rated up to 35. So I only get about an hour or so of battery life sometimes even less than an hour, rarely over an hour, because the CPU is not very efficient, and it's often at 100% load because it's not very fast, pushing its power consumption higher. So unfortunately, it's not that good. I'm using the original 56 watt hour battery pack that came with this laptop. It has about 8% wear, so I guess you could expect an hour and like three minutes if it didn't have any wear on it. Point is, unfortunately, uh, compared to Core 2 Duos, it's just not a very powerful CPU. It also seems near identical to the desktop Athlon 64 architecture. Comparing it against a desktop 2 GHz Athlon 64, its Cinebench score is almost exactly the same. There's only a 4.8% deviation between the scores, and I can only compare single thread because my 2 GHz uh, Athlon is a uh, single thread chip. It does have half the cache that this Turion chip does, however, so that probably explains why the Turion manages to pull ahead a little faster, despite it being a laptop chip versus a desktop chip. While we're on the topic of cache, this CPU doesn't have much, only one megabyte in total and 256k per core. All the Core 2 Duos on my list have at least 2 megabytes of cache in total, although some of them go all the way up to 6 or 12 megabytes in total, although they do have lower cache per core at 64k. Another thing you get with Core 2 Duos is upgradability. Yes, the CPU in this thing is socketed, but it's the fastest one. That it's the fastest Turion 64. The 2 gigahertz one is the, the best one you can get. Versus with the Core 2 Duos, I could go out and I could buy one that's quite literally twice as fast as the 1.6 gigahertz one, 
that I uh, compared this laptop to, and if your laptop supports Core 2 quads, you can buy one that is four times as fast. So there's not much of an upgrade path here. The CPU might not be great. However, do the graphics offer a competent competitor to Intel's GMA onboard graphics? Well, there's one way to find out. I doubt that ATI would slap the Radeon name on a really trashy graphics chip that just sucks, right? I mean, they, they wouldn't do that. Or actually, they might. The ATI Radeon X1270 chipset graphics in this laptop is legitimately the worst GPU I have ever seen. It is astonishingly pathetic. It is truly impressive how bad they managed to make a graphics card in 2007. You get a whopping four ROPs and TMUs, four pixel and two vertex shaders, with a max DirectX support of 9.0C. You get a pixel fill rate of 0.1 gigapixels a second, and a texture fill rate of 0.1 gigatexels a second, which is bad. You do get 160 megabytes of 400 megahertz memory, although we will get into that later because the way it's set up is actually fascinating. But the GPU clock is what lets it down, and it, it is so much let down that it is actually subterranean. The clock of this GPU is 20 megahertz. I'm not making that up. It is 20 megahertz. And, and let me just show you what that means for performance. I will launch our render test and we'll just see how it performs. It's not supposed to do that, by the way. And this isn't just a one-off. Across the board, the GPU is consistently able to subvert my expectations even when I set them incredibly low. It can't even run Quake 3 Arena at a playable frame rate, nor Unreal Tournament 1999. Both of those games are a good eight-ish years older than this laptop. and. Uh, graphics technology used to move a lot faster, you know, mid-early 2000s. So not being able to run an eight-year-old game is just awful. So for your entertainment, I've put together a satire ATI Radeon commercial using clips from this laptop and some footage from old AMD ads. I hope you enjoy. But if you don't want to see it, or you just don't care, or you don't like me, skip forward about a minute. Got an issue here. Yeah, my favorite games won't play well on this card. The top titles are AMD Gaming Evolve Partners. They are supposed to be the graphics leader. AMD is the graphics choice for gamers on PCs and consoles. Look, you need to get AMD. And just for comparison, this is how Unreal Tournament 1999 runs on an Intel GMA graphics chipset of the era. As you may see, it is actually playable, and the game runs at a frame rate that is a number.
you are no longer measuring in seconds per frame. With Intel GMA graphics, you are counting frames per second in the double digits rather than seconds per frame in the multiple. The Intel GMA graphics are able to handle older games like Unreal Tournament and Quake 3 Arena with absolutely no problem at all. And at lower settings, they can also handle some more recent ones uh, in terms of the laptop they're in, by, uh, like Unreal Tournament 2004. Also, this is running at 1280 by 800, the native resolution of this laptop, as well as the Latitude D531. In the D531's graphics tests, I was running it at 640 by 480. And if I tried to run it at an any higher resolution, uh, the level just would not load. So yeah, the, the graphics in the Latitude D531, they, they truly are that awful. I went in with pretty moderate expectations and still came out pretty disappointed. Unfortunately, the AMD Dell Latitudes just aren't good, and that is my final conclusion. It may seem harsh to judge every AMD latitude out there based on just this one, but keep in mind that this is the fastest CPU and GPU that you can get in one of these laptops. So it doesn't get any better from here, it only gets worse. And the designs of the laptops are pretty nice, so if you feel interested in picking one up, you can get a Core 2 Duo version that will have better battery life, far higher performance, especially with 3D acceleration, and you'll just be more satisfied with it overall. Though the laptop itself may not be particularly good, that doesn't mean that it won't still have some interesting technology inside. And that technology comes in the form of that god-awful Radeon graphics chip. You see, in GPU-Z, there are two different memory indicators, one for dedicated and dynamic. That may not seem all too interesting, but I noticed something odd when I was working on this laptop. Remember how I was saying that the other RAM slot is under the keyboard? Well, I discovered something fascinating when I disassembled it to upgrade it to 4 gigabytes of memory, and I will show you that right now. It comes apart just like pretty much any other Dell Latitude. You bend the screen backwards, you pull up this plastic strip, and then you remove the keyboard. Something I've begun to wonder is if the AMD and Intel motherboards are actually interchangeable. Obviously, you would not be intended to perform this upgrade as a user, however, I wonder if they are accidentally compatible in terms of space, and they use the same screws, and you can just screw them... Uh, oh no, I hit the power button accidentally. We don't want it on, so I'm just going to shut it off. Wait a second, I... I just noticed something. There are two buttons here that don't get used. What are those for? Because this one is for the wireless, this one is for power, and then... There are traces going to them, so clearly they're hooked up. Now, Dell obviously did this so that they wouldn't have to make different models of the keyboard for different laptops. But you could have used the damn buttons for the volume buttons instead of putting them on the keys so you have to hold down function and... Okay, that kind of bothers me. That that does kind of bother me. I'm going to be completely honest. That bothers me. Getting the keyboard out makes you feel like you're breaking it every time because you have to snap it off of the sides. And it really feels like it's just going to explode. And here we are inside this laptop. The wireless card is over here, obviously. Here is your other RAM slot, clearly, and there is your CPU. It is literally the exact same size as a Core 2 Duo, but the die itself is a little bigger, and the socket is obviously different. 
Under here is the ATI graphics chip. And right here is a 256 megabyte Hynix RAM module. And that is a DRAM or SD RAM like you would see on computer memory. That is SRAM or static RAM from looking up the part number and checking the Hynix datasheet. SRAM is commonly used for cache because like C-A-C-H-E, it doesn't require a constant refresh, which is based on the clock speed of your uh, DRAM memory. It's still volatile memory though, so that means that when it loses power, it also loses its information. So it's not like it's holding the secrets of the universe or the BIOS information or anything. No, remember those two different memory indicators in GPU-Z? That's because this GPU actually sips from two straws. From what I can gather from limited documentation and ATI's drivers, it seems to have two levels of cache, this being the L1 and the system memory being the L2. Things the GPU immediately needs are stored in this static RAM, and things that it doesn't immediately need but might need later are offloaded to system memory, and that also happens when this chip fills up. Less important data is shoved over into system memory. I don't know what bus width these are connected on. So that is a potential bottleneck. However, it does offload a good 160 megabytes from system memory onto this. So that means there is a lot less memory reserved uh, for the GPU than you would typically see, which is good because that means there's more system memory you actually get to use. So I just find that really nifty and I hope you do as well. That's not a threat or anything. I'm just saying I hopefully that was an interesting thing for me to say. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and put this back together, and I keep accidentally powering it on because the power button is on the keyboard. But with that, I'm going to wrap up my look at one of the last AMD Latitudes. It's a great example of why the Core 2 Duo was so successful and why you didn't really hear from AMD for a good while. The Core 2 Duo offered unmatched power efficiency, performance per watt, and performance per dollar that AMD just couldn't top them in. Well, I hope this video was enjoyable, I hope you learned something or laughed a little, and I, most of all, hope to see you next time. So thank you everyone for watching, and that's it for this one.